What is the gospel? They say it's good news. But why? It seems as though it is simply a list of do's and don'ts, and we keep beating ourselves up for not being able to obey them all. No, the gospel can't be law. The gospel has to do with death, but the death of sin, so that we can truly live. The gospel isn't a one-time thing. It is a journey, a journey through every area of life, a journey through our ups and downs, a journey through trials and triumphs, a journey to the Father's kingdom, a journey that needs to be rediscovered. Well, um, believe it or not, I'm coming up on uh, 35 years in ministry. I know it's, uh, you look at me and I look like I'm about 42, right? You sit back and think, how in the world can this guy have been in ministry 35 years? I started when I was seven years old. No, that's not true. That's not true. I've been in ministry, though, really almost 35 years. 35 years I've had the privilege of being in many, many churches, um, actually hundreds of churches. Many of those churches we visited when we were on deputation as missionaries. I was in a lot of churches when I was in college. I was in a, a singing group, and we traveled around the country, and one summer alone, I think we were in 50-some churches. And so I've been in all kinds of different churches. I've been in um, way too many all-white churches. Uh, quite frankly, I say that seriously. I believe the body of Christ ought to reflect the body of Christ. And I've been in uh, way too many churches where there was very little color out in the congregation. I've had the privilege of speaking in several African-American churches. That was fun. That was a blast. I was the only white person in those churches. And, uh, and uh, man, I tell you what, if you preach in an African-American church, they can get you revved up. They really can. And uh, I've had the privilege of uh, doing that. I've preached in many different countries. I've preached in many different types of buildings, buildings, church buildings like ours, school buildings, um, outside under trees. I've actually met with churches outside under trees. One of the churches that we started in Mexico City, we actually met in this patio, and they had all kinds of animals there. We would joke that there'd be about 30 people in attendance and about 20 animals, so we ran about 50 uh, in attendance. And so uh, um, I've been in churches that are extremely legal legalistic in my time. I remember uh, walking in a church one time and they had a picture on this uh, bulletin board right when you walked in that showed the way that men were supposed to cut their hair if they were a part of the church. Actually, it was a part of the church that insisted that, that ladies couldn't wear pants. And in order to serve in the ministry, the ladies would have to sign a, a form saying that they wouldn't wear pants Go figure. I've been in churches where, where the ladies, if they wanted to speak, they had to, they had to speak down below. They weren't able to speak um, up behind the pulpit or up behind the table. I've been in pastor-led churches. I've been in elder-led churches. I've been in deacon-led churches. I've been in unled churches where it seems like nobody was leading the church. <laughs> I've been in churches like that. I've been in churches that had great worship bands and uh, I've been in churches that, that didn't have very good music at all. I've been in churches that have a phenomenal children's ministry program like ours, churches that have a global outreach like ours. The simple fact is that I've been in many churches, and there's many things that I've learned, and I, I would like to think that I am a better pastor because of that. There's many things that I've learned that I've walked away saying, boy, I don't want to do that in any church that I'm involved in. And there's other churches that I've walked away saying, man, that's really cool. Um, we need to do that in our church. One of the most important lessons I've learned, though, is that it really doesn't matter if the church's music is conservative or contemporary. It doesn't matter what version of the Bible they're using. It doesn't matter whether they meet in a church building or whether they meet outside in the open air. What matters is if the church is focused on the gospel. Let me say that again. What truly matters with any church is whether that church is focused on the gospel. Now, let me say this this morning. Let's not be confused 
into thinking that every church focuses on the gospel. And let's certainly not be deceived in thinking that our church always focuses on the gospel. It's very easy for any church, it's very easy for our church to get distracted. It's very easy for us to focus on things that seem important, but they distract us from what we truly have been called to do. And that is to share and to live out the truth of the gospel. So the question that I want us to ask from Scripture this morning is this. Are we a gospel-centered church? And you can even personalize that question. Are you a believer who has the gospel at the very center of your life? You might sit back and say, okay, Brian, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a gospel-centered church? Well, I want to mention two things. These aren't in your notes, but I kind of, as I was praying through this, there's three things that came to, or two things that came to mind, and the second one will bleed into our outline today. The first thing that I wrote is this. A a gospel-centered church realizes that people don't need solutions to their problems. What they need is Jesus. Let me say that again, and I might be just a little controversial when I say that. What people need in this day and age, they don't need solutions to their problems. They need Jesus. I get a little frustrated as a pastor, as a preacher, you know, seeing people and, and, and pastors preach on everything to, you know, how to manage your finances, to how to be a good husband, to how to do this. And by the way, all of those things are important. I want, uh, I want to be a good husband, and I want you to be a good husband, and I want, uh, I want our wives to be godly wives. But, but, but so often we focus on things, we focus on principles, and Jesus is moved to the side. We extract, as it were, personal solutions to our problems, and we move Jesus to the side. We make the Bible and the gospel about us. And let me say very clearly, the Bible is not about you. The Bible is not about me. The Bible is about Jesus. And so a gospel-centered church elevates and lifts up Jesus and talks about Jesus all the time. He is the main topic. He is the focus of attention. He is the banner under which that church operates. The second thing that I would say is this. A gospel-centered church doesn't just preach the gospel, but a gospel-centered church lives the gospel. Let me say that again. A gospel-centered church doesn't just preach the gospel, but a gospel-centered church lives the gospel. You see, we have been commanded, and we should, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And week after week, we stand up, especially in this series, and we've talked about what the gospel is. But, but sometimes it's easier for us to say it than it is to do it. It's easier for us to declare what we believe than to live out what we believe. And if we're not careful, our words can be empty. We can be gospel-centered in doctrine, but we can live out or we can live in a way that is far removed from the gospel. And so for, for the last eight weeks, we've talked about rediscovering the gospel And we've gone through and we've defined the word gospel, that it means good news. And and we've talked about all different aspects of the gospel, that it's not just an event, it's a journey and how it affects every area of our life. Brad has brought some powerful messages and Mark has brought some powerful messages as we looked through this. But today I want us to see the importance of, for us to be a gospel-centered church, we must live out the truth of the gospel day in and day out. So having said that today, we're in Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter three, if you can take your Bibles or your iPhones or your iPads, follow along, we'll put the verses up on the screen. I'm gonna read the first four verses, then we'll jump down to verse 12. Paul says this, if then you have been raised with Christ, let me pause right there, Paul is speaking to believers. To be raised with Christ means that I have a brand new life in Jesus Christ. And so Paul is saying, if you are a believer, if you have been raised with Christ, then seek those things that are above. 
where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Jump down to verse 12 with me. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Verse 13, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Notice verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Would you pray with me, Lord? Help us to understand these verses today. Lord, help us to understand the reason why the Apostle Paul wrote them. Help us to see not only how they applied to the church at Colossae, to the Colossians, but help us to see how they apply to us today. We pray this morning that the Word of God would be alive in our mind and our hearts. God, help us to be a church that not only preaches the gospel and shares the gospel, but help us to be a church that lives that out every single day, whether we're in the building or whether we're at home, in our jobs, in our neighborhoods. Help us to be gospel-centered. Help us to be gospel-focused. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, Colossae, the city of Colossae, uh, where the church of the Colossians was located, was found in uh, the Roman province of Asia in what is today present-day Turkey. The Colossian church was established not by the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> Sometimes we sit back and think that Paul's the one that established this church. He didn't. It was, it was established by a convert of Paul's, a man by the name of Epaphras. Most probably while Paul was preaching in Ephesus, Epaphras had become a believer, and there he grew, and then he went back to his hometown, his home city of Colossae, and there he started a church. The Apostle Paul probably never visited the church of Colossians or the church of the Colossians, but he wrote a letter to them. The church of the Colossians was influenced by Greek philosophy, by by Gnosticism, by, by Stoicism, and we won't get into exactly what those things mean this morning, but those secular influences caused them to de emphasize. Jesus Christ. It caused them to emphasize other things, to emphasize, to emphasize philosophy, to emphasize secularism, and Jesus was kind of put on the back burner. The, the church became pragmatic in its delivery. It, it wanted to address things with which the community would understand and relate. And so Jesus was minimized. And philosophy, Gnosticism, Stoicism was emphasized. Similar to our culture, maybe we're not emphasizing Gnosticism and Stoicism, but it's, but it's so easy for us to pragmatically elevate other things and de-emphasize Jesus Christ. Well, in response to that, the Apostle Paul writes them a letter in which the Apostle Paul highlights the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. He shows them that the gospel is not just necessary for the birth of faith. In other words, the gospel is not just necessary for us to become a Christian, but the gospel should be a daily part of our Christian experience. And that's what Paul addresses in the verses that we're looking at today. And so if you're following along in your notes, the very first point is this. Our identity is found or should be found in the work of Jesus Christ. 
our identity as believers, who we are, how we identify ourselves, what we think of ourselves should be based, should be founded upon the work of Jesus Christ. In other words, it should be based, it should be founded upon the gospel. As we have repeatedly said through this series, the gospel is not just a a doorway that leads us to our salvation. The gospel is a journey that takes us through this life. The message of the gospel is not just for the unconverted. The message of the gospel is not just for the immature. I need the gospel today as much as I did 48 years ago when I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. And today, it doesn't matter how long you've been a believer, you need the gospel as much today as when you surrendered your life to Christ. You can notice my voice is leaving. Wilson, can you grab me a bottle of water? I think there's one in the, <clears throat> in the refrigerator back there. Haven't been yelling at Vicky this week. I don't want you to think that, okay? She was probably yelling at me. Uh, uh, our identity is found in the work of Christ. Paul mentions several truths. Here, in, beginning in verse 12, Paul mentions several truths which remind us of our relationship, which remind us of our identity in Jesus. Thank you, Wilson. Isn't he a great chairman of the deacons? <clears throat> There we go. Any better? Not at all, huh? (laughs) Paul says several things. First of all, Paul says this. We are chosen. Notice, Notice in verse 12. Paul says, put on then as God's chosen ones. Today, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been chosen by him. Last week, Brad, um, <clears throat> Brad shared the story of, uh, of when he and Kelly met and how they started dating. So I thought I would tell you the story of how Vicki and I met when we started dating. As a matter of fact, I pulled out a picture. Look at this picture. <clears throat> that was back in 1979. That handsome guy on the left is me, believe it or not. And that beautiful lady is Vicky when we started dating in 1979. I was uh, encouraged by some friends to ask her out, and I was scared. She was like one of the most godly girls in our church, and I'm like, she wouldn't go out with me. And so I, I asked her out on a date. I was so nervous. I went up to her, and she can remember. And, you know, rather than being formal, I'm like this. Um, Vicky, do you think you'd like to go out with me? You know, not sure whether she'd say yes. Is, is that the way I was? That's why I was so nervous. And she said, yes. So we went out on a date. I took her bowling the very first time. We went to a bowling alley. We were the only ones in the bowling alley. Nobody else was there. The employees were so bored, they stood there and watched us like this. (laughs) Pretty awkward. You know, we couldn't talk about anything because they they were so intent on watching us. Had a good time that night. I went home that night, honest truth. Told my mom and dad, I'm going to marry that girl. That night, I chose her. Now, she didn't choose me right away. (laughs) Took her quite a while, honestly, to choose me. I remember after a few months, I think, I was so enamored by this girl. I looked at her on a date, and, and here was my words. I looked at her, and I said, Vicky, I love you. Now, when you say that, you want what, what? You want a reciprocal response, right? And so you want her to look at me and say, oh, I love you too, Brian. I looked at her and said, Vicki, I love you. And here was her response. No, you don't. No, you don't. For, for her, it was honest truth. Am I telling the story right? Honest truth. Huh? Took her a long time to choose me, all right? I had to convince her that I was the one, and I'm sure there's days that I still have to convince her that I am uh, the one. Listen to me. In the same way, God chose you. 
let's not be mistaken what is taught in some evangelical circles that we choose God. Some, some view God as if this, uh, the, the, this divine being up in heaven that's looking down at you and I saying, pick me, pick me, pick me, as if he's begging us to pick him. The simple truth is this, God chose you before you chose him. We see that over and over in Scripture. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. I don't know about you, but I wasn't around before the foundation of the world. But he chose me before the world was created. He chose me and you that we should be holy and blameless in him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. So if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, here's your identity. You have been chosen by God. God specifically chose you. Paul Paul says the second thing, not only are we chosen, but we are set apart. No, notice verse 12, what he says, put on then as God's chosen ones, the next word is the word holy. Now, now that is a word that, that you probably wouldn't use to describe yourself. If I asked you, uh, um, Ray, describe yourself this morning, Ray would probably say, handsome, intellectual. I, I, I don't know what Ray would say. I'm joking. Um, but, but I venture to say Ray, nor you or me would look and say, holy. <laughs> That's one of the words that describe me. I'm holy. We, we probably wouldn't use that word to describe ourselves. The word doesn't mean, though, perfect. The word holy doesn't mean sanctimonious, as if I, you know, you, you know lived above everyone else. The word holy means to separate. The word holy means to isolate something for a specific purpose. So, so when Paul looks at you and me and he says, okay, you've been chosen by God. You have been set apart. You are holy. You are distinct. God has isolated told Brad I was going to bounce off some of his illustrations. He gave the illustration about Kelly last week. He also, if you'll remember, gave the illustration. He said, has anybody ever been in a house in which there was a room that was off limits? You weren't allowed to go in. Remember Brad saying that last week? Well, the moment he said that, Vicky elbows me. Not, not because we have one of those rooms in our house, but my mom and dad had one of those rooms in our house. We, we had a living room that was off limits. I'm not exaggerating by saying that there would probably be years that I would not enter into our living room. That, that was like this set apart area. My mom had this like, a, it was like an inner sanctum. It was beautiful, nice furniture, beautifully decorated, but that room wasn't for us. That room was for guests. You say, Brian, how often did you guys have guests? You must have entertained a lot. Hardly ever. <laughs> and so, but, but, but mom and dad had bought all the furniture. They had bought the pictures. They had done everything. They, they decorated that room, and they set it apart for a specific purpose. And that purpose wasn't for us to use. That purpose was so that when people walked in the front door, and actually when guests came, we didn't even sit in the, in the living room. We sat in the family room. And so it was only so that when people walked in the front door, they could look, oh, you have a nice front room right there. And then we would go to another room. The room was literally off. Anybody else have one of those rooms in your house? I mean, you probably did. It, it was what? That room was set apart. It was distinct. It was for a specific purpose. That's the word Paul uses when he describes us. He says, you have been chosen by God. You have been set apart. I didn't put this in your notes, but three things. You have been set apart from something. You have been set apart to something. And you have been set apart for something. 
I have as well. First of all, you have been set apart from the world. God has called us out from the mainstream of mankind. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, Paul says this, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. You know, we don't talk much. The word church in the New Testament is the Greek word ekklesia. I always pronounce it with a Spanish accent. And so if you're a Greek scholar here, you know, please excuse my mispronunciation. But, but very similar to the Spanish word iglesia, the Greek word is ekklesia. And it literally means called out once. And the idea is that those of us who have trusted Jesus Christ as personal Savior, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have what? We have been called out from the world. He's called us from something. But he's also called us to something. You say, Brian, to what or to whom has he called us? He has called us to himself. And so he has pulled us out of this sinful, wicked world. And God says, here's what I want. I want you to be one of mine. And I want you to be with me. Not just now and not just in the immediate future. But I want you to be with me for all of eternity. Come to me. How often does Jesus say in scripture, come to me. All you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We're called out from the world. We are called to him. We are set apart from something to something, but we're set apart for something. You said, Brian, what are we set apart for? We're set apart for righteousness. We're set apart for righteousness. Let me say this. When believers fail to act differently than the world, we violate the very purpose for which we have been called. It's like taking something holy and defiling it. It's like taking the, the instruments from the temple and using those instruments to feed animals That would be abhorrent. Nobody would ever do that. Why? Because those vessels, those instruments were set apart for a specific purpose. Oh, man, church. God saved me for a purpose. God God pulled me out of the world for a purpose. God draws me to himself for a purpose. And that purpose is that I might become less like the world in which I am living and more like the Savior to whom I am being called. Notice a verse that Paul uses in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. Who saved us and called us to a holy calling. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So so here's what Paul says. You're chosen. You you are holy. You, You have been set apart by God for a specific purpose. He says one last thing, and you would guess this one. You are loved. Notice verse 12 once again, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. In other words, you are loved by God. Let me, let me just pause and explain that because I think we get that, but I think we don't get all of it. God's love for us is not conditional. Sometimes we think, God's love for us is conditional. If I love God correctly, then God is going to love me. If I do what I'm supposed to do, then God is going to love me. If I go to church on Sundays, God demonstrates his love for us. If I live righteously, then, then, then God demonstrates his love to me. God loves me because I love God. What an erroneous thought. God didn't start loving you when you started loving him. God loved you way before you ever loved him. 
In 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. Listen, I don't want to create a controversy here, but Vicki loves me because I loved her first. <laughs> I don't want to take the credit for this relationship, but I'm the one that started the whole thing here. Before she ever realized how fantastic of a guy I am and that I was worthy of marriage, she, I knew that she was the one. And I loved her. I told her way before she told me. Now, I think she knew it. She was just afraid to admit it. I think so. God loved you way before you loved him. God loved you way before you understood the gospel. God loved you, loved you way before you changed your life. God loved you way before you became the person that you are today. God doesn't love you. He doesn't love me because we've changed. He doesn't love us because of who we are. He loves us in spite of who we are. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his love for us while we were sinners, not perfect. Listen, we understand that with the gospel, but sometimes if we're not careful, we don't realize the reality of that in our everyday lives. You see, God loves me on the days that I'm faithful to him, but God equally loves me on the days that I'm unfaithful to him. God loves me on the days that I spend a lot of time in prayer. And God loves me equally on the days that for some reason I'm so busy that I forget about him. He loves me just as much. He loves me when I love him. And he loves me when I don't love him. Listen, here's what I want you to catch. And as we wrap up this series, I want us to understand this. As believers, our identity should not be found in our jobs. Our identity should not be found in our families, and all of those things are important. Our identity should not be found in our race, and I'm not saying don't be proud of your race. Our identity should not be found in, in our political beliefs. Most certainly, our identity should not be found in what sports teams we follow. My identity is found in the work of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter whether my football team loses, I'm a child of God. Now, it took me a few minutes to remind myself of that at 11.40 last night. But I had to remind myself in bed, okay, we lost. But you know what? God's still on the throne. We lost, but I'm still a child of the king. We lost, but I'm chosen. I'm set apart. I'm loved by God. I'm afraid if we're not careful, we find our identity in so many other things instead of in Jesus Christ. What's a gospel-centered church? A gospel-centered church is a church that understands that its identity is found in the work of Jesus. I am who I am because of the gospel. If you go back to the beginning of this chapter in verse 3, Paul makes this statement. He says, your life is hidden with Christ in God. What does that mean? That means that God is so big that I can hide behind him. And, and when people see me, they don't see me, but here's what they see. They see God because God overshadows me. My life is hidden in him. In verse 4, Paul says, and Christ, who is your life? Huh. Let me ask you today, is Christ your life? As a believer, he should be. Let me show you a second thing. Not only is our identity found in the work of Christ, but Paul says that our unity should be marked by the love of Jesus Christ. What unifies us together, what distinguishes us, is the love of Jesus Christ. John 13, 35, you know this verse. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for the other. As followers of Jesus, our greatest characteristic should be love. It should be what distinguishes us from all others. Notice how Paul fleshes this out. I want you to catch this today. Notice in verse 13, he kind of tells us how to do that. In verse 13, he says, bearing with one another. 
And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving one another. So, so, so what does that word bearing mean? It means to endure. It means to tolerate. Uh, I wrote down in our notes, we put up with one another. Doesn't always mean we like each other. It doesn't mean that sometimes we don't get on each other's nerves. Uh, I like how Alistair Begg, if you've heard Alistair Begg, what a great Scottish preacher, but, but Alistair Begg made this statement. He says, it doesn't mean that every now and then we wouldn't like to kick each other's butts. Alistair Begg's words, not my words. I don't think I've ever used the word butt in the pulpit before. But here's what it means. We tolerate one another. We endure one another. We put up with one another. We refrain from doing what our flesh would like to do. Why? Because we love each other. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 12. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we don't defend ourselves. We what? We retreat. You see, the gospel causes me to love those whom I do not like. The gospel causes me to embrace those whom I would rather run away from. The gospel causes me to stand there and listen to somebody who is obnoxious. And I don't want to stand there and listen to them. The gospel causes me to care for those who do not care for me. Let me say today that I am certainly not so naive to think that there are not problems between members of Hollywood Community Church. I know there are. Anytime you get 400, 500 people together on a regular basis, there are going to be problems. You say, Brian, why is that? We're all believers. Yeah, but we're sinners first. And, and that sin seems to come out. Those sinful attitudes seem to come out every now and then. But the gospel causes us to look beyond that. The gospel causes us to put up with one another. He says a second thing that we alluded to a few weeks ago. We forgive one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. We won't spend time here, but the simple truth is this. We forgive not because someone deserves our forgiveness, no, we forgive because we have been forgiven when we did not deserve it. And God forgave us something that we could have never, ever des deserved. He says a third thing. He says we are bound to one another. Verse 14, and above all this, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. It's like putting on the belt, and the belt just kind of what? It holds everything together. Paul is saying, that's what love should do for us. You see, see, here's what a church is. A church is a mixture of imperfect people who come together under the banner of Jesus Christ and even though we have differences, and, and my oh my, do we have differences in our congregation. We, we have racial dif differences. We have political differences in our congregation. We have all kinds of differences. The idea is not to have a congregation in which everybody is alike. I've been a part of those kind of churches. I don't want to be a part of those kind of churches because I don't believe that illustrates the gospel. The gospel is when people who are diverse, who think differently, come together and they're able to love one another, not because they unify what they think or not because they all dot their I's and cross their T's the same way. They come together and they love each other because that's what the gospel demands of us. That's the kind of church we need to be. And I would commend you. I think that's the kind of church that we are. A church that embraces everybody regardless of their background, regardless of their past, regardless of um, their racial distinctions or political distinctions. We are bound to one another. 
A gospel-centered church loves in spite of, and you can fill that in with whatever you want. So what is a gospel-centered church? A gospel-centered church is a church whose identity is found in the work of Jesus Christ. A gospel-centered church is a church that, that, that is marked by the love of Christ. And he makes a third distinction, and I'm done. He said, thirdly, our activity takes place in the name of Jesus Christ. Notice verse 17, what an all-encompassing verse. He says in whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so let me say that again. Whatever you do. Is he only talking about church-related things? No. Is he only talking about things that we do on Sundays? No, he says, whatever you do, whatever comes out of your mouth, whatever actions that you demonstrate with your life, with your body, whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Our activity takes place in the name of Jesus. That's pretty inclusive, is it not? In words and in deeds, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we work, we work in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we play, we play in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we experience success, we experience success in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we suffer loss, we suffer loss in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever we do, we do it in his name. That's the banner, that's the flag that flies over us. The flag that flies over us is Jesus Christ. We used to sing, I don't think I sang it the other day, we used to sing this song um, when, I was, uh, when I was a kid. There's a flag flying high in the castle of my heart, in the castle of my heart, in the castle of my heart. There's a flag flying high in the castle of my heart, for the king is in residence there. You see, the flag that flies over my life, the banner that is over your life every single day, Whatever you do, in word or in deed, all the time, it's Jesus Christ. You see, we are living representatives of him. How do we do that? He gives three quick ways. Let me mention it, and we're going to take the Lord's Supper in just a few moments. Three quick ways. Paul says, first of all, we are ruled by the peace of God. Verse 15 and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Rule, the word rule describes the activity of an umpire. It's actually the word that is derived from that, an umpire in deciding the outcome of an athletic contest. Here's what Paul is saying. The peace of Christ guides us as we make decisions each and every day. So I'm about to do an activity, and I ask myself, is this activity consistent with the fact that I am a follower of Jesus Christ? Will this activity leave me with a sense of peace, or will I later feel guilty? Will I later feel disappointed? Will I later feel offended? As a believer, my life is ruled by the peace of God. He says, secondly, we are filled with the words of Christ. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word dwell means exactly what it seems to mean in the passage. It means to live there. And the idea being that the, the word of Christ, the word of God should what? Should live in our hearts. It should live in our minds. The truth of scripture should permeate every aspect of the believer's life. The truth of scripture should govern our every thought, our every word, our every action. The words of Christ should fill us. And the last thing he says is this, we worship with a thankful heart, singing psalms, singing hymns, singing spiritual songs. 
Our worship should be about him. Too often, worship becomes about us. It really does, and I think sometimes we're guilty of that in some of the songs that we sing. You know, we sing songs like, uh, I'm so glad that I'm here this morning. I'm so glad that I can attend church. I'm so glad that I can be with my other believers. And we sing songs like that. The the problem is that sometimes there's people here on Sunday that don't want to be here. And so if they actually sang what they thought, they would sing something like, I really don't want to be here this morning. I wish I was bomb in bed. I hope the pastor doesn't preach very long. Amen. Our singing shouldn't be about us. What what is the type of singing that glorifies God? It's the singing that is about him. It, It is the singing that exalts and lifts up Jesus Christ. It's the singing that doesn't point us to us. It's the singing that points us to him. Gospel centered in everything we do. What does it mean to be gospel centered? It means our identity is found in the work of Christ. Our, our, our actions are marked by the love of Christ. And our activity is, is done under the name of Jesus Christ. So, so I've given you a couple of questions in your outline. Would you look at them quickly for a second? These are, these are introspective questions. These are questions to ask yourself as we conclude today. Question number one is this. In whom or in what do you find your identity? What what truly identifies you? Is it the gospel? Is Is it your relationship with Jesus Christ? Or is it someone else? Here's a second one that that, that hits all of us and hits me. Is there anyone with whom you need to restore a relationship? A brother or sister in Christ that you haven't forbeared very well. A person that whenever you walk in church and they're in one side, you go to the other side. Or if they're on one side of the street, you go to the other side of the street. You avoid them at all costs. They're a follower of Christ but you just don't have a relationship with them. Wow, I'd encourage you to restore that relationship. Can you say today that all of your activities are ruled by the peace of God? They are guided by the word of Christ and that your activities bring praise to Jesus and Jesus alone. When those things are true, we can be a gospel-centered church. When those things are true, I can be a gospel-centered believer, and you can be a gospel-centered believer.